So my name is JT Jeleno. Uh, I am the owner, founder of Mushrooms Naturally. Um, we began as a business uh, eight years ago. So 2014 uh, in April, I leased the warehouse that we're in now. Um, we grow and sell about four to 500 pounds of mushrooms every week and sell direct to restaurants mostly. We're in about 40 restaurants and country clubs in the area. Um, before I started growing for a living, I was a chef. I went to culinary school. I worked at uh, Bell Reef Country Club for 11 years out in town. I was on the culinary Olympic team. I got to travel around the world and do competitions. Um, so I was pretty successful in the, the culinary industry. Um, but I was just always interested in growing food and producing food and making things that were food products, you know, just as much as I liked serving a 12 course dinner to 20 people. So um, when I moved into my house um, about 10, 11 years ago, uh, one of these falls, I was kind of winding up my garden project. I was actually doing aquaponics in my basement. Um, I had a 90 gallon goldfish tank and I was growing in a couple gravel beds and cycling through and um, just doing more research into aquaponics, I found a product that you add to your water. It was called mycorrhizal, it was something I've never heard of, no idea what it meant. And they said, yeah, just add this to your water and it'll help break down the fish waste and make things more available. And then down in the bottom of the corner of the, uh, the website, there was this little thing that said, hey, save coffee grounds and grow your own mushrooms. So I was like, oh, that sounds pretty reasonable. I work at a country club. We throw away five gallons of coffee grounds, you know, every. So I started a little project in my basement, kind of down by my aquaponics setup. Uh, that slowly turned into most of my basement, becoming a small scale version of our mushroom farm now. I'd sell to some of the chefs that I knew in town. Uh, I started doing the Lake St. Louis Farmer's Market on Saturday before I'd go into work. Um, so, you know, it was just kind of growing 30, 40 pounds and just the producer, chef and me, just kind of liked the process of getting into it. And really, once I, I learned more and more about mushroom cultivation, the, the sterile lab work, the sterile procedures, the transfer of mycelium and you know, pouring petri dishes and starting this whole biological process just kind of took over and I just kept learning more and more and researching more and more, doing more projects and, you know, just kind of kept sitting in my head that nobody else in town is really cultivating the mushrooms, you know, that all these chefs and, you know, myself included are using. There was uh, Ozark Forest that was doing a lot of uh, shiitake mushrooms and things like that, but you know, none of the varieties of like lion's mane or maitake or any of that was even close to being locally produced. If anything, they were all produced on the West Coast or the East Coast. So something in me just kind of said, all right, you know, let's give this a shot. And so uh, we started about, uh, like I said, 2014 and have been going ever since. Um, basically, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to go through the life cycle of mushrooms and kind of wrap your head around how we utilize their natural growing life cycle, how us as cultivators can take something that grows in the wild that needs to be kept very clean in order to reach an end product. So how many of you have ever grown mushrooms here? Anybody yet? Small projects, nothing, one. So you can see some examples of live growing mushrooms here right now. We've got lion's mane, we've got some poplar, oyster mushrooms, we've got hen of the woods mushrooms here. And all of these are what are considered cultivated mushrooms. So every one of these mushrooms that you see in front of you started out as a petri dish, which started out from spore. So basically, in, in nature, and the reason why mushrooms produce spores so prolifically in the billions to trillions is a, a game of odds. And that is because, in fact, most of mushroom growing in their life cycle, especially if it's as part of the active growing mushroom, is done sterilely, naturally. 
This is something the mushroom body itself does. This is why antibiotics are a thing because mushroom mycelium naturally repels, defends against bacterial infection, yeast and, and uh, other fungals and things like that. So what we try to do is recreate their natural growing process. So everybody's heard of spores, right? Spores are basically the seeds of a mushroom. Um, it's not exactly right to think of them as seeds though. Um, so when mushrooms germinate, two spores have to find each other. So it's not a single spore, it's not an asexual process, it's a sexual process. And in fact, two spores of the same gender have to find themselves. And we're not talking about two genders like us. There can be up to 28,000 genders for mushroom spores. So to think of something to find a perfectly clean spot to fall out of a mushroom on Find a similar gendered spore, have it moist enough, have all of your growing conditions ideal, find that spore. If all of this stuff happens in nature, those two spores will start growing filaments that are called hyphae. So when you look at this Petri dish, some of it might be kind of hard to see for some people in the back, but the, the media that is grown on is all black. We add charcoal to it. And so what you see, this fine white mycelium, this is two spores that are germinated that started producing hyphae, which are individual filaments, almost like straws that have a tip that is the active growth tip, form what's called a mycelium or a mycelial network. So the mycelium is what is the body of the mushroom. This is, if you think about it in terms of tomatoes, this is the plant of the tomato. This is what does all of the growing. This is what does all of the digestion of nutrients to feed itself. Basically, mycelium is the mushroom. This is what you don't see very often, but this is what does all of the work. Any questions about mycelium yet, or basically spore germination? So, that being said, you have to get the spores to germinate, grow, find the right substrate. So in the woods, let's say two oyster mushroom spores landed on a tree limb that just fell six months ago. They land right on top of the bark, just in this perfect spot. They germinate, they start forming a mycelial network. So now what that mycelial network is going to do is it's going to start spreading out and digesting all of this nutrients that's in the wood. Their primary food source, cellulose and lignin. Lignin is the very tough woody substance that plants produce as far as their structure goes. Cellulose is what you think of as carbohydrates or sugars that basically are much more readily available food source for a lot of things. Mushrooms are the only thing on this planet that break down lignin. Without mushrooms, we would literally be buried in thousands of feet of plant matter. Cellulose is a viable food source for lots of things. Bacteria, archaea, any kind of microbe basically can eat cellulose. It's a very simple form. Cellulose structures ring together into these big complex tough knots, that is what is called lignin. That's what bark is. That's what the structure of a tree is. Like I said, without mycelium, without certain fungi, nothing would be able to break that down. So let's say our oyster mushroom has been, the mycelium is growing, it's digesting all of the nutrients in this recently fallen branch. It's been doing that ever since it fell on there in March. And now it's October. <clears throat> so the seasons are changing. It's cooling off outside. It's pretty humid outside. It's moist. That's when that mycelium, after digesting enough nutrients, 
being in ideal growing conditions, we'll say, okay, we've done all this work, we've got enough, we're large enough, let's reproduce. So that's when the fruiting body or the mushrooms that we think of are, come out. As soon as their growing environment outside in nature is ideal for their growth, every mushroom variety is different. A majority of ones that grow around here is spring and, and fall time. So it's a little cooler, it's a little humid. That's when they'll put the effort into putting up a mushroom, spores will drop and start that whole process all over again. So that is the basic idea of how mushrooms sit there and perpetuate themselves. That's why mushrooms produce spores in the billions and trillions. Because the odds of them releasing spores at just the right time and just the right condition, finding just the right sexual partner to, to start the process is, is difficult if you're not producing billions of possible potentials. Any questions on basics as far as mushrooms, cultivation, and everything? So, go ahead. That is their food source. Okay. So, so how mushrooms grow and digest is, and you can see on this bag here, there are some small mycelial spots that are starting to radiate. Mushrooms eat by their mycelium producing enzymes. So these enzymes are what chemically break down cellulose and lignin into baser forms. So, as this oyster mushroom is spreading its way through the log, any kind of cellulose, which is base sugars, things like that, that's pretty readily available. Now, the enzymatic process that they do is a lot more time consuming. And depending on the variety, depending on the food source, can take weeks to years for them to actually excrete enough of those enzymes to break that that lignin, these big complex cellu cellulose-based structures down into baser cellulose. And once that's done, that's a ready food source for them. And in addition to doing that, typically if there is mycelium in the soil, if there's anything else present besides just wood, nutrients such as phosphorus, heavy metals, they will also digest those and make those more available which is obviously one of mushrooms' greatest advantage when it comes to the relationship with plants. Without mushrooms' ability to break down some of these metals, some of these organic compounds that are otherwise bound and locked into the soil, they would never be able to, to be uptaken and utilized in a chelated form for plants. So this is, this is why mushrooms are a must as far as plant existence go because they literally make their food available in a huge percentage without mycelium and sterile soils you're never going to get any kind of copper uptake naturally unless it's chelated it's same with iron and things like that so so uh in your garden when you dig the soil you break up you break these things up mm -hmm. does that does that destroy them or does it just grow back and it, it all depends. You mean as far as like the mycelial networks yeah, and things in your soil? Yeah. So, you know, and this is one of the biggest advantages to no-till, you know, and any kind of regenerative agriculture is to not disturb these mycelial networks. There, there are some mycelial networks that are the largest organism in the world. Um, the honey fungus out in, in Oregon and Michigan and places like this cover almost 2,000 square miles, and it's all one organism. You can take Petri dish samples from miles away and put them together and they grow seamlessly. So to, to say that a mycelium that big couldn't be disturbed and still kind of regain itself, sure. But now if you had morel mycelium, which is a far more fragile, finicky you know, form of mycelium, or even better yet, if you were growing white truffles in Italy, the last thing you would want was somebody to rip out your oak tree, you know, that has all your mycelium in it. So the more you can leave these networks together and established, the more 
in depth their benefit becomes. There are, there's no reason why some of these things, if nothing changed environmentally, wouldn't live for thousands of years and they only get more efficient at what they do. So that's kind of the idea is if, if you're sitting there ripping out plant roots constantly that these mycelium have an association with, you know, say you've got a whole raised garden bed and half of it's peppers and tomatoes and eggplants. Well, at the end of the cycle, as opposed to just cutting the plant at the roots and leaving that intact, you know, if you rip it out, then yes, you are going to hurt your mycelial, you know, network and all of that stuff. Chances are it'll grow back, you know, but if you keep wounding something constantly, you know, it never has the chance to grow to its full vitality. So everybody has heard of like spore syringes, right? Kind of sounds familiar. It sounds like a process that everybody uses. Spore syringes versus a liquid culture as far as cultivation goes. A liquid culture is tissue from a mushroom or live active tissue from a petri dish that is guaranteed to grow this one specific mushroom. This is a gray oyster mushroom culture that is called King Blue. Somebody went through the effort of putting spores on a petri dish, growing it out, finding different mushrooms. It's a lot like kind of isolating seed strains basically and kind of isolating genetics. Somebody went through a lot of trouble to find this genetic. So if we took spores from this and started growing, there is almost no chance those genetics would look like this. It would be an oyster mushroom, but there's nothing to say that the temperature parameters, any of the growth parameters would be the same. Because every time you go back to spore, you are taking billions of new genetic potentials and putting them into play versus us keeping this culture alive from a petri dish and constantly using this culture to start growing with this way we guarantee they will always be king blue if we go to spore it's a crapshoot the the idea i like to tell people if we want to grow Cher purple Cherokee tomatoes, we can do that. We save the seeds from them. We make sure they weren't cross-pollinated. We could even take clones of that plant. Same thing with mushrooms. If you clone tissue, if you make sure that it's the same genetic organism, that's fine. If we take this and we start from spore again, that's like us taking a billion different varieties of tomato seed and hoping to get another Cherokee tomato. Well, chances are it's gonna be a green zebra or a thousand other varieties of tomatoes. You can think of mushrooms. These are, oyster mushrooms are tomatoes. Lion's mane are squash. You know, our, our poplar mushrooms are a different variety of plants. So you can't just sit here and mix an oyster mushroom with a lion's mane and come up with a new variety. Dogs, cats, horses, you know, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're that different families, genuses and all that. So when it comes to cultivation, going back to spore makes very little sense. Only if you want to try to isolate your own strain, come up with your own genetics, or if you're growing from spore with a species that often produces similar results. So manure-based growing mushrooms like cubensis that often produce a very similar result constantly with spore makes sense to go to spore often. Now, if you grew those out from spore, every mushroom you grow from that could technically be genetically different. So if one of them is eight inches tall and one of them is three inches tall and you want a taller mushroom, take tissue samples from that one taller genetic. But to go back to spore again, it would for any of our cultivation process just would not make sense. So that's why we have to keep a sterile culture bank. So we have a sterile lab, 
a sterile lab facility out at our place that has a sterile air filter. And we keep a master culture bank and several different copies of all of our cultures. We've grown some of our varieties of mushrooms all eight years from the beginning without any genetic strain or drift. It's always grown the same exact mushroom. Now, from time to time, we try out different cultures for different varieties just to see if they grow better in our setup. But even to have the ability to go to a company like Aloha Medicinal Mushrooms, and let's say you want to grow oyster mushrooms, but you want to grow yours outside on logs, okay? That's a whole different process than us cultivating inside on sawdust. So you would want to find a strain that was intentionally selected and bred to grow in outdoor conditions on logs versus one that is meant to be grown indoors on sawdust in an exaggerated process. And again, you are not going to get that if you go to spore. That is where you want to find a culture for whatever you want to grow. Does everybody kind of understand the difference between spores and cultures? So it's, again, it's like cloning something constantly and never changing that original genetics versus going back to seed every, every time. It sounds exhausting. It could be anything, you know, depending on, on how big the syringe is and everything else. That's why whenever I tell people, and, I, and we'll, we'll go through and I'll show you how I like to treat spores if I were to start something originally. And basically that would be to go to a Petri dish first before going to a substrate like grain or a bulk substrate like a manure or a wood-based substrate. That way, at least you can see expediated growth on a Petri dish and you can do what's called isolations at that point. So if we took a spore syringe and just took the smallest amount of a drop that we could drop out of there onto this Petri dish, chances are we'd probably get a hundred to a thousand different genetic variants. Most of those would germinate too because they are all of the same mushroom cap and the way mushroom does gender and all that stuff. It's actually advantageous to kind of go back in that sense. But let's say a hundred of those spores germinate every, and they'll all start growing out unilaterally. So they'll start from the center where we put that drop of water and you'll see mycelial networks start growing towards the edge of this plate. Now, some of them will grow out really fast and look puffy and thin. Some of them will grow short and hardy. Some of them will grow at a moderate length. You'll see inconsistent fingers grow in a radial pattern all over here. What you can do in sterile condition with a, a, a scalpel and another clean Petri dish is you can take the leading growth of some of those different radials. So if you want the one that grew the fastest and you want one that looks the cleanest, and one that looks the hardiest, then you take a little piece with a scalpel of that growth and put it onto a new dish. Now we're isolating cultures. Now let's say that one that you thought was fastest, that you took just a tiny piece of, let's say you've knocked that down to 20 different genetics now. Okay, so that one, so you went from 100 to now 20 genetics on one Petri dish and then all of your other plates would be similar. So now we take this new Petri dish and we'll watch the growth on that. And it will be far more uniform. Nothing will exceedingly grow faster, nothing will exceedingly grow slower, but you'll still notice some growth difference. And again, you go through and you do another isolation process. So now we pick a couple more growth tips that look healthy and nice. If you do that two to three times, chances are you're about as close to a monoculture or an isolated culture as you can get. Now, if you're starting from spores, you could have gone through all of that work. What we just talked about is months worth of work. And they could do nothing. They could do absolutely nothing in their final growth substrate because you have never seen this brand new genetic do anything. 
you've seen its precursor do plenty, but you've never seen this eat any kind of wood source. So anyway, the, the, the point I try to make is going to spore, you can absolutely create your own culture. You can create your own genetics with certain things. It's, it's fast, it's viable, but with some cultures, almost all of the culinary varieties, it's almost a thousand times better off to buy a culture than it is to go to spore, unless you really just wanna go through the hunt process. But like I said, there are companies that have done this for years and just completely failed and, and thrown away tons of time and effort to find these good cultures that they sell. You know, they're not cheap, it's just like buying good seeds or anything else, but in theory, I buy one of these Petri dishes, I could grow a million tons of mushrooms over a hundred years if I keep it clean. All right, so how we cultivate out at our farm is, again, we buy in cultures. So they come in plates, but let's just say you created your own. You could take this Petri dish that has that mycelium that you've bought in you know its growth parameters, you know the food source it prefers. Now we're just gonna kind of send it on its natural journey. So from this one culture here, we could take a scalpel in a clean air system, take a little chunk of this agar media and drop it into one of these bags of sterilized grain. So from that one little piece of mycelium that we take from the original culture, that will start to spread out. And that's gonna coat all of these seeds. This is just a milo, it's just a bird seed. You can use any kind of whole seed, basically, or grain. These have been cooked, and these have been sterilized uh, via steam. So we put them in pressure cookers. All of this media gets treated for about 45 minutes at 15 PSI, which is about 272 degrees which is high enough to kill almost all competitive molds or bacterias aside from like extremophiles that live in like ocean vents and on crater, you know, craters on the moon. So everything in here is st sterilized, cleaned, and now we've introduced the mushroom body via the tiny piece of agar to it. So what that mycelium is then gonna do, it's gonna recognize this as a viable food source these seeds are full of cellulose, they're full of lignin, they're hydrated, so they've got enough water in there. They're sterile, there's nothing to compete for. So what that mycelium is going to do is with its fine little fuzzy network, it's going to start spreading out and coating every one of these seeds in an attempt to digest it, to break down the nutrients. But what we're going to do is we're going to wait. As soon as all of these seeds are perfectly coated, now what we have is called spawn. So spawn is a term in mushroom cultivation that basically just refers to a vehicle to transferring the body of mushroom from one source to another. So we're using this spawn, these seeds that are coated with the body of mushroom, to go from our culture to our final growing substrate, which is hardwood sawdust based, same food that they would get from a log or tree in the woods. Now. The benefit from making spawn and going this route versus just trying to inoculate a big bag of substrate with spores or anything is we can watch this mycelium grow. We can expand it. We can make sure it's staying clean. We can make sure it's healthy. But not only that, we can expand exponentially this way. So we can take this one pound of spawn that would be considered a grain master at this point because it is the first thing we inoculated with our Petri dish, our culture, we could take this one, one pound grain master and make 10 of these. So we'll sterilize 10 of these bags. Actually, what we do is we step up to two pound bags. So twice as full, one of these will make five. So in our sterile air system, we'll cut the top open, spread this out into five bags. Those five bags seal up. Now that mycelium, there's only a small percentage of this that's coated, goes into another new food source and starts spreading out. So now we have 10 times as much spawn. We have now from one pound, we have 10 pounds. From those two pound bags, we've got five of them, we can make 
three of these six pound bags. So we had five, we can make three, so that makes 15 six pound bags of spawn we have now. Just by expanding through spawn production as opposed to just trying to inoculate this bag by itself. It's faster because it's used, the mycelium is now used to this food source. So it only takes a couple weeks to go from spawn type to spawn type. So now we have what's called our third generation or our bulk spawn. Okay, so it's taken about a month and a half to get a full cache of bulk spawn. So let's imagine that we've got 30 of these bags now, okay? From one of these bags, we can inoculate 30 of our bulk substrate bags. So basically by expanding from one tiny little chunk of agar, we can now inoculate almost two tons of sawdust media just by expanding through spawn, as opposed to just taking our spore syringe and only inoculating this one bag of bulk media. So at our farm, we sterilize and process about 800 of these bags every week. So 800 bags gives us about 500 pounds of mushrooms. And again, every week we produce and process more spawn. We keep this cycle going so every week we can produce the same amount to sell to chefs. It's not just a one-time planting of tomatoes in a greenhouse that we're gonna harvest in three months from now. We have to do this constantly to have a constant supply of active spawn going. Any questions yet? So, all of this sterile spawn production, all of this beginning process of mushroom cultivation is by far the most difficult part. This is why we sell spawn already produced. This is why we sell media already sterilized because for the home cultivator, it's difficult to do any of the sterilization without having like a, a facility. But now that's why I'm gonna show you guys, there are several ways on smaller scales that you can utilize something as simple as this glove box to do all of this. You don't have to have a lab. Now, obviously you're going to be limited a little bit on your volume as opposed to being able to work in front of a six by three laminar flow si hood system. But any of these smaller processes are still possible. You can do, I started all of our cultures uh, in my kitchen, on my countertop, in a glove box. So it's possible to stay clean and sterile, but if you are just a home grower that's looking for the experience of fruiting some mushrooms and just harvesting some, seeing how to kind of finish off the process, then going to like one of our, you know, grow your own mushroom kits where this bag is full of sterilized media that we inoculated with our spawn that has already been incubated and aged for weeks. So this has months worth of processes in here already. Yes, I mean, that's the idea. Now, the actuality of that takes years for them to truly, like, go through and digest all of that. That's like even, like, our five-and-a-half-pound um, grow kits that we sell. You know, in theory, there's enough food source in there to grow for two years. So we, we may only get one harvest of them out at the farm, but if you were to take those same blocks and put them outside in your yard, you'll see seasonal growth through them for a couple years because of how much food source is in there. Now, <clears throat> there are ways to kind of slow growth even. So if we made a bunch of spawn, you know, we don't want to necessarily go and spread it all out right away. We want to kind of slack it out over a couple weeks. You can just refrigerate it and some of it you can even freeze um, because they're used to this kind of environment to where in the wintertime, you know, they naturally get frozen outside. They just go dormant. They have natural... The, most mushrooms produce a natural version of antifreeze. 
and things like that. So there are ways to retard the growth enough to where you can have, we can, we basically do a big spawn production once a month. And that's enough to keep all of our production going at the farm. When I started at my house, I used to make a big spawn batch like once every two or three months. So in theory, you can spend about half a day doing spawn and culture work and set yourself up for cultivation for a while. Any other questions as far as like the kind of general life cycle or moving anything forward from Petri dish or spawn? Go ahead. So the spawn bag, where, where is that stored at? What, what's the... it, it all depends. Now, typically with spawn, we try to keep ours in the dark and we keep it at about 70 to 75 degrees. And you have to think about this is the beginning part of the mushroom's life cycle. So this is what's typically not seen by people. So done under subs, you know, under leaf litter, done behind the bark of a log. So it's usually dark. So most spawn run is done in the dark, which kind of helps. If you introduce light too early, it can almost tell them to start producing mushrooms as opposed to coating all of that grain. So dark and usually on the warmer side of their liking, um, so usually with all of our varieties, about 75 degrees. And that kind of simulates their natural growing throughout the summertime. So almost everything we grow grows in like the fall or spring. So during their active growth, they can take warmer temperatures, which actually helps them grow faster. So it helps your spawn grow faster. And then the dark will help them just focus on growing as opposed to trying to produce mushrooms or think other things are going on. So to answer your question, best place for spawn, dark, somewhere warm. So, I mean, so when you're putting it away, you're mm -hmm. not using it free. Oh, the refrigerator. Okay, yeah. Okay. If, if it's going to be months, and only some spawn can, can freeze relatively well, but in the refrigerator for most varieties, you can add months to its shelf life that way. Now, so there are some varieties, like some of our king oysters and things, that are so cold tolerant, they will continue to grow in the refrigerator. And so you can imagine a, a bag of seeds like this that's already been cooked. All this mycelium will just keep growing thicker and thicker. So after a certain amount of time, it's almost impossible to break up those seeds into individual seeds anymore. It kind of grows into one solid chunk. So that's one of the biggest issues you have to look for it with spawn storage especially is that a lot of them will continue to grow and it will make it almost impossible to get your seeds individual to then spread to your bulk substrate. All right. So what I am going to demonstrate now, anybody know what this is called? Anybody ever seen one? A still air box, yep, goes by a glove box. Um, SAB still air box is typically the most thought of. This is something very similar uh, to what's used in almost any kind of biological industry. Um, so, you know, you think of working with viruses in movies and you see people sticking their hands in rubber gloves into these containers and stuff like that. That is because the air inside of here is meant to be kept as clean as possible. And the reason being, the air we're breathing, everything on us right now, everything moving around in front of us, the air coming out of my mouth, is completely covered, coated with yeast, molds, bacterias that we don't see but are on and around us constantly. What we don't want to do is introduce any of that airborne contaminant into our media because what that will do is it will give those airborne contaminants just as viable of a food source in a home as it will the mushrooms that we're intending to grow so to keep things clean and sterile in the very beginning processes of mushroom growing is is a must there is no other option and if you if you've ever started or tried to grow from culture or tried to sterilize your own media or any of these things, you will quickly realize how difficult it really is. And you will begin to realize how dirty everything is. 
everything around you. And so that's why out at our farm, what we have is called a laminar flow hood. So it's basically a big box that has two HEPA filters in front of it that pushes air through those filters. So the air coming out in front of our table work surface blowing in our face is completely clean and sterile and filtered. It's 99.9% .9 clean of anything that could be around. So imagine us having this work air filter blowing this clean air. So now we can freely open up this Petri dish in front of that air system without risk of mold spores falling on it because that sterile air system is constantly blowing them away from the media that we're trying to work with. Well, not everybody at home has a laminar flow system and that's pretty reasonable. So this is the closest thing we can get to working in clean, sterile air. It'll never be actually sterile. Neither is my clean room. Our clean room with our best effort would be maybe consider a level 1 million, meaning that there is one airborne contaminant for every mil million parts of air. A truly clean clean room is a level 100 to where there's not even in 100 parts one particle or that, that small. What we go for in a still air box is just to spray enough alcohol, cleaner, things to eliminate molds and bacterias, and then let the air settle. That's why it's called a still air box. You want it as still as possible to not agitate air, uh, anything airborne contaminant wise. So all this is obviously is just a big Rubbermaid tote. Um, if you are going to build one at home, the things that I have always tried to look for is to make sure it's as see-through as possible, uh, to make sure it's larger than what you originally thought because you're always going to want more space inside of this. And then when you do go to cut the holes in there, obviously there's tons of tools and ways to cut holes, but just be practical and put your arms to your side and measure. Don't just kind of blindly put holes on there because I've had one to where I literally had to work like this and it's just, anyway, a little bit of thought in the, in, in the construction goes a long way. So what we are going to show today is basically how to transfer to start a spore syringe. So I'm going to show you how I take that spore syringe and I'll put some onto an agar plate and then we'll also inoculate a bag of grain. We're going to walk through how to take that bag of grain and then transfer it to a final substrate, our hardwood sawdust media, and then just kind of talk through some of the key importances with procedure and how to keep your your media sterile there's nothing worse in mushroom growing than going through all of this work and spending a day of working with your pressure cooker making sure all of your media is sterile and then two weeks later finding just green mold in everything that you grow you know because you forgot to put on a new set of gloves when you went out of your glove box so there's a lot of really kind of you really have to put yourself in a scientific organized mindset to do the very initial processes of this to keep yourself clean organized sterile to limit your exposure to outborne contaminants is the only way something like this works you can't really half-ass this and expect good results you could get some now with our setup at, at our farm with our flow system it's a little more forgiving you're working in an actively moving sterile airstream. That's a lot easier, but still our number one contaminant risk out there is the employees doing our work. So it's them not brushing their teeth and, and not wearing a face mask one day, or it's scratching your head and not thinking about it and then taking that hand and trying to, to move some media around. And so it's, it's just very, it's very important to kind of really, consider how potentially dirty some of this stuff is when you really try to put the effort into it so you don't just create mold you know that you don't want that being said putting together a little packet like this with your day's project is key so inside this bag there is our petri dishes there's our spore syringe there's a brand new sterilized scalpel in here 
there's clean gloves and there's alcohol. This whole thing, before I even put it in this glove box, this outside of this bag is going to be sprayed down with alcohol. So the outside of this bag will be initially clean and it'll go in our glove box. And then we're gonna spray alcohol all over this glove box in order to kill any molds or bacteria that are gathering on it right now as we talk, as it's open. Did you spray items before you put them in the bag? Or? So typically, and especially at home, if you can get single use sterilized products, scalpels and things like that, it makes life a lot easier. Otherwise you have to learn how to sterilize yourself in your pressure cooker and then transfer from that pressure cooker to a, a, a clean air system like that. In which case, if I were, if I were taking all this stuff out, every piece of this would get wiped down with alcohol, loaded into this bag, just to sit at, in, an, in an empty room, then get sprayed down again to go in here. There is no amount of redundancy as far as cleaning everything you touch that is bad. You know, the, the worst thing you can do is assume things are clean and just try to use it anyway, you know. Again, some of this stuff, some of this, these processes, you know, to transfer from your brand new $400 culture to grain and not think to clean your scalpel and ruin everything sucks. <laughs> that, that's a good, that's a good point. So we use 80% alcohol. And so we actually custom blend it. We buy 91 or 99% alcohol. Now 90 and 91% alcohol will kill just about everything, but it evaporates too quick to effectively kill most molds and bacterias. So to dilute it down to about 70 to 80% puts enough water in that alcohol solution that once it lands on a bacteria, that bacteria will actually try to draw in that water like it needs it. And that is how alcohol gets into those cells and kills things. Now, if that's 99% alcohol and you spray it on that bacteria, it will recognize the toxicity of that and close itself up. And it won't try to bring in any of that liquid to itself. So in fact, if you're using a higher percentage cleaner uh, like that, you can have a harmful effect and kill less things than to have a dilute version. So that's, that's something that it's pretty commonplace in most biological fields, but mo most everyday people would, would not even begin to think about th that being a, a diluted version more effective. So yeah, 80% alcohol is our standard go-to. Just water, just distilled water. Yeah, yep. And we use a number of cleaners too. So again, most, most bacteria and molds, if they are commonplace in your house, like you, know, you clean up every day, things get used to certain cleaners. So if you only ever used alcohol, you will eventually breed bacteria that are alcohol resistant. So we switch back to like Lysol, we go to bleach, we use hydrogen peroxide. We'll use a variety of cleaners. But if ever I'm using day of sterile work, is always alcohol because it evaporates so quick. Even at 80%, it's still only, you know, it's 10 seconds versus three seconds, you know, to evaporate and kind of have a useful working surface. Now, is you, you wiping it off with a cloth? Are you letting it just evaporate? Yeah, typically we just let it evaporate. And what I tell people, especially when you're working in a glove box, you can literally have alcohol dripping off of you onto whatever you're working with that is the better case scenario than not having enough. So you're better off accidentally getting some into your Petri dish and killing a tiny, a tiny amount of your, your mycelium than to not use enough and have mold spores get in there instead. So to be excessive with the amount of alcohol, it's so cheap. You know, this is, that is really between that and learning how to keep the air as still as possible are the only ways you overcome the the working in uh you know your house kind of environment versus an actual lab okay so like i said we are going to um inoculate this bag here of grain 
we are going to take that grain and transfer it to a bag of finished substrate. And then we are also going to do some Petri dish transfers. So I am going to start out. Grabbing our alcohol. Um, I mean, we don't, we don't buy cultures anymore. Okay. Uh, it's only, it's only really, you know, just like any kind of, uh, agricultural industry, somebody always comes up with a better strain of something. That's, that is the only thing that ever entices me to try something new. Because even, even buying in a culture, it's still closer to, to six months after we go through all of our processes that we can even see if they grow right in our setup. You know, <clears throat> all right. So basically with my glove box here, I just had these little caps that screw into here. You don't necessarily need this. Some people like to attach like kitchen gloves on the inside. I don't like doing all that. That's too much constriction. You'll find out that once you start working in the glove box, <clears throat> just how fast you want to be with your transfers as minimally involved as you want to be with your transfers. It's just faster to kind of do things quick and excessive with alcohol as opposed to trying to, um, you uh, use glove, like glove setups and things like that. Basically but what I'm trying to say is don't, don't put gloves on your glove box. It's, it's a waste of time. <laughs> All right, so now that we're in our glove box, we're going to assume, obviously, you know, our hands are dirty. We just opened up our portholes, so everything, even the air that we just cleaned in here is dirty. We're basically using the alcohol in here to capture way down and clean airborne contaminants. So as this alcohol falls and settles to the bottom of the box, it's trapping and cleaning stuff and the air is getting stiller and stiller. So hence the still air box. Oops. Okay, so first what we are gonna do is we are gonna show you how to take your spore syringe and inoculate this bag of grain and also a Petri dish at the same time. This will give you two forms of germination. One of them, you can go ahead and use your grain instantly to transfer as soon as it's colonized. And then your Petri dish will basically act as a backup copy that you can go ahead and perpetuate like we talked about earlier. You could make your own grain spawn from that. You can take that one Petri dish and try to do isolates and spread it that way. You can make many more Petri dishes from the one. But either way, it's a good idea to not just use your whole syringe on one project. It's always better to diversify it, especially right at the beginning. So here we have our syringe. So this is uh, our yellow oyster mushroom. <clears throat> so we made these the other day. This is basically just spores that we dropped onto a piece of tin foil, gathered, sterilized, and then mixed with sterile water. This is a sterilized syringe that we put this in. And so the syringe was then sprayed down and put into this bag. So again, we're gonna spray this, we're gonna spray the bag. Even though everything has already been cleaned, we're just gonna to try to be as repetitive as possible. So we'll take our syringe out.
This is our little tester Petri dishes. These are just solo cups, you know, that you use in restaurants. These work great as Petri dish substitutes if you want to try learning how to pour your own. But these are basically what we use to quality control all of our media. So we'll take little pieces of all of our uh, batch that we've steamed on Wednesday and put it on here and we'll check it to see if there's any excessive mold growth. So basically it allows us to see if the media that we are transferring is dirty on a, micro, on a microbiological level as opposed to spreading it constantly. But we also have a backup now too of our genetics. This is a Petri dish here. I don't know if you guys can even see in there. <clears throat> so we have a fully colonized Petri dish here. So I'm also gonna show you how to use your sterilized scalpel to take from this Petri dish and inoculate your bag of grain. That is the process that we use at our farm. We never use syringes for anything at our farm anymore. There is no, there's no point for us to do it. Everything is done from Petri dish via scalpel to grow media. The only time we would ever use spore syringe or go back is if we were trying to do an isolate from a culture that we found. So, now that we have our culture in here, got our sterile scalpel, got a couple pairs of gloves, and then I've also got some towels that I soak with alcohol. We're gonna pretend like I put the gloves on. I, I don't know if you guys have ever, these are powderless gloves because our lab tech can't do latex and I cannot get them on my hands. So <laughs> I assume my hands are purple now. <laughs> okay, so we've got our alcohol, we've got our alcohol wipe, we've got our sterile syringe, we've got a scalpel, we've got a Petri dish plate that is full of a culture. We have an empty Petri dish plate that will be accepting our spores. And then we have a sterilized bag of grain that we are going to inoculate. So again, it's just redundancy to kind of keep everything clean. But usually with these bags, there are all of these creases in here. So it's good to kind of take your alcohol wipe, get in there, kind of get all the creases, especially the surface that we are gonna open up and use with the scissors. So this is all wiped down. Where'd our scissors go? We are going to clean our scissor blades really well. Again, in theory, even your scissors that you put in here should be sterilized ahead of time. We're gonna open up our bag. Okay. And so now we have one or two options and typically you would not have both of these, but we're just doing this for demonstration mostly. <clears throat> so with our spore syringe, if this were an injection port bag, we could just take our spore syringe, open it up, stab it into our injection port. We would unload about half of the liquid that's in here, and then we would save the rest for our Petri dish. So pretty simple. You just kind of unlure the, or unlock the cap on it. You would go straight into the port as quick as can, unload about half of the solution, take it out, and then wipe it down again with alcohol. And now this remaining spore solution, we are gonna put onto our Petri dish. So the rest of the liquid is now on this dish. We'll go seal that up. And so now spores will germinate on our Petri dish. Spores will germinate in our grain media. Now the other option you have if you have a petri dish culture and you are not going from spore which again is more or less what i recommend especially if you're trying to just be productive we would take our petri dish 
it has been wiped with alcohol. We wrap all of our Petri dishes with this plastic film called parafilm. And that basically just keeps it from opening and keeps it clean. We've got our single use scalpel. If I can get it open. Yeah, it's getting a little steamy. Usually I don't I don't do stuff in a garage. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's just use our scissors. I got another question. Yes, sir. The needle, the actual needle. Uh huh. It don't need to be sterilized because it because it's sterile already. Came on the pack. So when you when you buy a syringe, they should be somewhat sterile already, but it's always a good idea to sit there and clean them again. Now you can't heat sterilize the syringe if it's got spores in it, because you could kill the spores. So the only thing you can do once you have your syringe already filled with is just to try to clean it the best you can. And now you can always, and you can also flame the uh, needle so you can hold a flame and that will heat sterilize your entire needle. So the liquid coming out in theory will not pass through anything that is in that actual needle itself that is dirty. Those are the only, now you can't really flame sterilize in a glove box. So this would be something you would have to do outside of the glove box. Flame sterilize your needle, wrap it in aluminum foil after you've sprayed it heavy with alcohol, transfer that. And so now that that's wrapped in foil, then you can put that in here, wipe that foil off with alcohol, take your needle out, wipe that off with alcohol, and then you should be about as close to clean as you can get. So you say that flame won't bother the spore in the tube? Or it, no, because you won't be cooking the liquid. You're literally, you're just sterilizing the needle itself, which is typically the most dirty part of, of that process because the liquid that has the spore in there should be sterile already if it was done right. If you're buying a spore syringe from anybody that's selling them, it should be clean already. And that's a clean flame with propane, Yeah, I mean, I've got like a little ceramic heater, but just like a little alcohol torch, even holding a lighter and just, you know, using that for count, give it a good 10 second count. Typically they say, Especially for like scalpels and needles, you want to see them glowing red hot. And that's about how you can tell that they're as clean as they can get. But we, we only use reusable scalpels at the farm because we've got a, a little ceramic sterilizer. So every use we can, after every time we touch a Petri dish, we stick it back in there. Now, with what we're doing here and what's best for home cultivation is to use the single use. So you saw this, I just opened up medical grade sterile packaging. So this is completely sterile. It's never seen dirty air until it's been in here. So this in theory should be perfectly clean, workable tool. Just wipe the meat off with the alcohol wipe. Yep. Okay. So now that we've got our sterile cal uh, scalpel, we've got our culture. We're gonna take just a tiny amount so usually for one bag of grain, all you need is about two or three small pieces, about the size of a pea. I usually cut little triangle shaped wedges. There's really no wrong reason. What you wanna consider when you're doing this, again, even though this is all done in an air box or still air box, even though you've seen all this alcohol I've sprayed and everything, this is technically still not sterile air in here. So. The idea being, as soon as I lift this lid off of this culture, we are now exposing it to, to contamination, right? So the fastest I can take this lid off, take my scalpel, take a little chunk of this media and put it in the bag and seal up that bag, the less exposure we are to contaminant. So in that, in that mindset, it's always good to kind of pre-prepare your, your setup. So. I'm going to make sure this bag's open, right? I'm not going to sit here and try to open it while my culture's open and fumble around and do all that in front of it. So we're going to eliminate that potential. When we open up our culture, 
I'm not going to sit here and wave my hand over the top of it. I'm not going to sit here and scratch my, my other hand. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to try to keep this scalpel as far away in my skin, as far away from it, take just a tiny piece and drop it in. Okay. So again, anything you can do to kind of limit your exposure from your culture, the more successful and cleaner your transfer will be. So, all right, we got our bag open. We got our culture in our hand, lid, the parafilms off. I just got to pop the cap on this scalpel. I'm going to take a piece and we're going to transfer it. So I've got just a tiny little piece of this media that's got mycelium right on the tip of the scalpel here. And all we do is hold it right over the bag, just barely, give it a couple taps until it shakes loose and it'll drop right in. Now you can do a couple of different chunks like that. It Technically you only need one in there. It just might take a little bit longer. But we usually do three different transfers. Okay, so we've got one, two, three in there. So now, as quick as we can, we're gonna seal up our Petri dish, hoping to keep our culture clean. We are gonna close this bag up, and we're gonna use one of our little bag clips here to seal it. If I can find where the bag clip was. Anyway. All right, so it's clipped. All right, so we're gonna take a pause and we're just gonna kind of look at all of this stuff real quick. So now that everything is sealed, all of our containers are sealed up again, we've got our Petri dish that we put some of our spore solution on. We've got our culture that you can see that we've taken some of the wedges out of that we can now keep this. Oh, here are those stupid bag clips. Oh, here it is. All right, so these are bag clips. So these are a reusable way to seal up these bags if you don't have a heat sealer. So what we would do is we would obviously take smaller versions of this, but we would take this bag, we would put this on here, right above the filter patch. So now this bag is sealed. Everything inside is sterile. We have now introduced our yellow oyster mushroom culture to this grain. We're gonna shake it up a little bit, just so those chunks of that agar kind of mix their way in. And within the next couple days, we'll be able to see fresh mycelium growth coming off of each one of those little pieces of agar that went in here. The filter will allow that mycelium as it spreads out to breathe, it will exhaust carbon dioxide and it will take in oxygen. So this bag is now basically ready to go into the dark and wherever you wanna keep it, you know, in a cupboard or whatever, and sit for about two weeks. So in those two weeks, that mycelium is gonna coat all of those grains. And so now we have made our grain spawn, our grain master, that's our first initial spawn. So after a couple weeks and once that's fully colonized, we can sit here and get uh, three of these six pound bags, or again, we could do five two pound bags and expand our spawn and now we have tons of viable media to go to our final substrate. And what that would look like. So this block here, this is our hardwood sawdust. This is some soy hulls. It's been hydrated and sterilized. This is an ideal food source for all of the mushrooms that we grow. Oyster, hen of the woods, lion's mane, poplar. This has got all of the cellulose, all of the lignin in there that a fresh fallen tree in the woods would have. This is a primary decomposer's final growing substrate. So what we would do is we would 
load all of our material back up in here. We would obviously not have any of this. But we would take our grain master that we produced. We would, again, spray everything down. So after this has been sitting somewhere in your house, these are all covered with different kind of molds and bacterias on the outside. Good news is, is they're pretty easy to clean up. but you want to be thorough and make sure that you try to get, especially towards the tops of these bags, where we're going to open them and transfer media. Stuff on the very bottom probably won't be too much of an issue right away, but let's make sure we get in these gussets and all of this. Make sure that this is as clean as we can possibly get it. So again, <clears throat> anytime we go back in the glove box, it's very important. Make sure that your hands, anything that you put in there gets cleaned right away. So we're going to grab our alcohol, spray our wrists, spray our hands down again. This would be a good time to put gloves on. Okay, so the idea here being we are trying to transfer our fully colonized grain spawn into its final growing media, this hardwood sawdust. It's a pretty simple process. This is probably the easier part, but it is still very important to keep everything as clean as possible and to limit your exposure, especially for your final growing media because this, will, this mycelium will still take another few weeks until it's ready to produce. So if at this point to where we transfer our grain spawn into our final growing media and we are a little bit haphazard with how it happens, in a week to two weeks, this bag will be full of green mold as opposed to fresh oyster mycelium that we want. So make sure everything's sprayed down. Make sure your air is about as still as you can get. We're going to take our bag clip off. And at this point, we can actually <clears throat> cut down some of this. So we will respray all of our tools. I'm going to cut a majority of the plastic off of the top of our grain bag just to give a shorter neck. And now this is where it's important to move as fast as we can. Oh, oops, I got to cut this one off too. We're gonna open our oyster bag, or our bulk media bag. Okay, so now as fast as we can, we're gonna transfer our grain into our final substrate, which is just as simple as dumping, just like that. Seal the bag up as fast as you can. You'll put your bag collar back on. And so in theory, our one bag of grain, even if that were just two pounds, we could have inoculated four of these larger bags of substrate. Just because you only need about two to 10% spawn to total volume of your growing substrate. So that is where the exponential expansion of using spawn also comes into benefit. Especially if you're running a commercial operation like I do, for me to use 2% spawn versus 10% spawn is the difference between hundreds of dollars of product and labor a week. Now, if you're just going for home grow to get a good solid yield and you wanna overcome slightly dirty conditions, you increase your spawn rate. So you will go closer to 10 to 50% spawn. Now, just imagine if, all, if half of the media that we dumped in here was already clean established spawn, it would take no time at all for it to digest all the nutrients in here. Now, if we only do 2% spawn in here, 
it's going to take that much longer for that mycelium to spread out and digest all the nutrients. So that's the biggest trade-off. If you have enough spawn to be excessive will always lead to faster growth and hardier growth and, and basically help you overcome potential contaminants. If you try to spread your spawn out as thin as you can and make as much media as you can, you run the risk of not having enough in there and it taking longer, so a greater chance of potential contaminants to overtake your, your media. Any questions on any of the sterile technique? So now, you know, whoops. Thank you, sir. So after you inoculate your bulk substrate with our spawn, what we would do is we'll sit here and we'll mix up this bag just to spread the spawn out. And now these go into our aging room, our incubation room. So depending on the variety of mushroom, oyster mushrooms take about two weeks of incubation time. So two weeks for that mycelium to spread from the spawn to digest all of that sawdust, the nutrients in the sawdust. And you will see in this bag right here, there are some of that spawn, you can see them kind of starting to jump off and starting to spread their, and start their process. Here, you can just pass that around if you wanna. But that's our bulk sawdust with 2% spawn in there. And you can see about how much that takes. That's about five days worth of growth from that mycelium. Those will take almost two more weeks until that mycelium has completely digested all that nutrients in there. All right, any other questions for cultivation? Any terms or? No, so you, get, you guys are all experts? Once we got to this bag right here and we spread it around, mm -hmm. that's what's going to produce this. Yes. Okay. So this bag now is the same thing that any of these are. So this is that sawdust that was inoculated. These varieties were probably inoculated four, five weeks ago. And the mushroom growth that you see on here was about one week's worth of growth in our grow rooms. So after inoculated, they sit at about 75 degrees in the dark, anywhere, you know, two to eight weeks. And then we take them from that environment, which is pretty stagnant and, you know, warm, dark, and we move them into our grow rooms. <clears throat> That's where we expose the mycelium to more fresh air humidity, cooler temperatures, and light, and all of those things signify and signal the mycelium to reproduce. So we basically recreate their natural growing environment, time of year, habitat, in our grow rooms via humidifiers and all of that to basically trick that mycelium to thinking it's their prime growing time. So they attempt to grow the mushrooms to reproduce. So while they're in a dark room, Mm -hmm. There's no need to even look at them. Do nothing. nothing. Just, just leave them nope. Yeah, just, I mean, check on them just to make sure that nothing's contaminated. Um, typically, after about three to five days, most contaminations are visible. So we would notice a little patch of green mold starting right up here in the corner, in addition to all of our mycelium starting to grow. Even if it's a tiny amount of a contaminant, 99% of the time it wins versus the mushrooms that we want to grow. Right. Yep. So you can sit some, like oyster mushrooms are pretty vigorous. They will eat bacteria. They will eat some mold contaminants, but not much of them. Most other myceliums are not strong enough to, to counteract like trichoderma and stuff like that. But yeah, basically at this point, you set it, forget it, come back in two weeks. Hopefully it's all beautiful and clean. And at that point, you can break the sterility you can cut open the bag and put it into your grow environment and then it'll, it'll reproduce. This, this is the last stop to where sterile is important. <clears throat> so you get just a single yield out of bag? 
So every variety is different as far as how long in between harvests it takes them. And that's our biggest limitation with how much we fruit them at our farm because it takes space to keep them. So like our oyster mushrooms here, these will actually get three harvests off of. It takes about six to, six, six to eight weeks. So these bags will sit on our shelves in our grow room. They'll produce this. This is their very first growth right here. It'll always be the biggest and it'll always be the best looking. So the first harvest, we'll take that. Well, I'll pick these today. In about seven to 10 days from now, a new batch will start growing. We'll pick those and then we'll, every time it's a little bit less and a little bit less. So depending on how much less it is and depending on how much time it takes in between harvests depends if we get one harvest or we get multiple. With our hen of the woods or our maitake mushrooms here, it takes twice as long to harvest and they will almost never ever reproduce another mushroom in cultivation until you kick it outside and let nature do its thing. So these are one and done compost. Now, honestly, that doesn't matter. As long as they make a mushroom, the spores are just as viable from a first growth or a second growth. But you won't get nearly as many mushrooms to choose from on a third growth versus a first growth. So let's say, let's say these were like random spores and I'm trying to find a culture for the biggest, chunkiest, you know, pearl oyster possible. I would rather them try to make a bunch of them so I can choose the two biggest ones to choose from as opposed to it only produce one or two little ones and have less option. Mm -hmm. Whatever you guys are using, can you be rotating other ones in there into the same constantly? Going together? Yep. Like I said, like as soon as as soon as you once you once we go from our incubation room, which is where they just sit in the dark and age. Once they've aged and they go into our grow rooms, these are no longer sterile. Our grow rooms aren't sterile. There's not you know filtered air or anything in there. That's more or less up to their own natural defense. So we basically break down our grow rooms into four sections. Every week we rotate a section out, or some of them are in eight sections, but and yeah. Section yep, and we harvest mushrooms every day. So somebody has to be in those rooms constantly maintaining and monitoring the different varieties. And so yeah, it's, there's a constant rotation of media. And, I have a question. Yeah? Um, at your grow room, what's the, um, like the environment? So, all of the varieties that we grow are ones that naturally grow around here in the spring and fall time. So we try to aim for 60 to 68 degrees temperature. Um, all of our rooms have uh, lights in them, but they're just standard shop lights. They're not grow lights. They don't need intense plant light. They don't photosynthesize, but what light does to mushrooms is it guides their orientation and it also helps develop pigments in their, in their caps and things like that. In addition, we also circulate fresh air because a lot of our varieties you would think of finding in the woods, right? You know, just kind of walking through, seeing on a branch. Well, if you circulate or keep them in a stagnant air environment, as they grow, they produce CO2. You know, opposite of plants, same as us. So same thing with us. If we stay in an environment where the CO2 keeps getting higher and higher, they will actually slow their growth down. Or what we do intentionally for mushrooms where the stem is just as culinarily sought after as the cap. So with these mushrooms, we try to stretch them. So we intentionally keep the CO2 level higher in that room, which causes them to grow longer and stretchier. Just like if a log was on the ground in the woods and a bunch of leaves fell around it, okay? And that mushroom wants to start its growth process. Well, it needs to distribute its spores into the wind, right? Well, if it's covered in leaves, it can sense that the CO2 is higher there. So that mushroom will grow long and stretchy to reach fresh air. So that's basically what we do with these. Their natural appearance looks more like an oyster mushroom, but we tell them to look like this. So the light that you're using inside these rooms is just a fluorescent light? 
Yeah, we just use water type, watertight uh, T8 shop lights. Nothing special nope. There. Nope. 12 on, 12 off, and that's, uh, honestly, you can leave them on constantly and it doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. So that's a that's another good point, and usually something I talk about in the beginning. So <clears throat> everything that we grow here, all of these samples, everything that we produce as a culinary mushroom, is what is known as a primary decomposer. So. Primary, secondary, and tertiary decomposers are basically how they classify most mushroom varietals. So these would be the first things to settle on a recently fallen tree or a log. They are, all of these varieties are white rot producers that specialize in breaking down lignin. And because of that, those are the first ones on the scene to break down that lignin heavy material. So let's say an oyster mushroom sat there and broke down a log after years and years and it's kind of turned into pulpy compost, kind of looks like mulch sort of thing. Now there's tons of bacteria involved in here too. All of, a lot of that um, uh, lignin is gone, leaving just a lot of cellulose. So now a secondary decomposer can come in and start breaking down that same material. The same way that they do to, uh, if a cow eats grass in a field. So they're taking a fresh, healthy plant. This cow is chewing this material, digesting it, which also helps break down and makes some of that plant matter more available and adds beneficial bacteria to that process. And then those are pooped out by you know whatever animal it is which is also another way of making compost and so then again a secondary decomposer can come and start digesting that material that is full of active bacteria that they eat which is full of higher cellulose lower lignin material so portabellas button mushrooms Cubensis, a lot of like field mushrooms are all secondary decomposers. So the food source that you would give to them would be more of our manure-based substrate. So for that substrate, we compost our wood-based substrate and we add worm castings too. So again, more broken down, exposed plant material that's richer in cellulose and lighter in lignin but also plenty of beneficial bacteria to which those secondary decomposers digest and eat in addition to that wood-based material. So substrate matters. So do you ever have to worry about your masters going bad? Do you ever oh, yeah. to rotate those to another plate? Stuff like that? Yeah, to, so the, the standard protocol is you keep what's called master slants. So our Petri dish is basically the same, th same idea, just in a test tube that's a little bit more airtight and freezable. So those master slants are typically what you buy a culture of. And so every year we go back to that master and we start Petri dishes that we start all of our grain from that will come from that year. You don't ever want to go too far away from your master culture because you will run into synthesis problems, which means your culture becomes less viable after so long. So if we just constantly kept making grain spawn and kept moving it forward and forward, that, that mycelium will, get, will, re, will reach a point to where it's gotten so weak and so overexpanded that it's just not healthy anymore. So to go back to a master once a year, once every couple of years, or even once every six months is pretty standard procedure. Anybody else? Any recommendations for setting up an area in our house on a small scale to do this? Yeah, you know, again, it depends on the varieties. A lot of people tend to start growing oyster mushrooms. Um, because of the fact that they don't necessarily have to be grown on sterilized media. 
You can do it on like pasteurized straw or newspaper or pretty, pretty common things. But the growth parameters for oyster mushrooms require so much fresh air that in order to keep things humid and your air fresh enough in your house is actually pretty difficult. They're one of the harder ones for us to dial in at the farm. Now to grow something that we intentionally grow with a higher CO2 concentration, like our poplar mushrooms would be pretty easy to do almost anywhere in your house. So I guess I would tell you, if you wanted to set up something that grows just a generic wide variety of mushrooms, any of those like shelf Martha tent kind of greenhouse setups with a small humidifier and a fan. Um, but some way, if you're growing oyster mushrooms, you have to be able to bring in outside air and bring in fresh air. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Males? As all cultivation experts now? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, we do tours out at our farm. That is often the most helpful for people to come out and walk into our growing environments. It's one thing to read about it. It's one thing to see a picture of it. But to actually put yourself into our grow rooms and be like, okay, this is what he means by humid, cool, fresh air. You know, it's, it's something that you can see how the mushrooms respond to. And then once you start home projects and you realize, well, why are these mushrooms long and stretchy with small caps? You'll think back, well, that's because my CO2 is probably too high right now. I have to lower my CO2. Why are these like this? Well, your temperature could be too high or you're not humid enough, you know? So I definitely invite any, any and all of you to come out and kind of check that out firsthand just to get a good sense of, you know, what, it, what it's like to really... Because setting, setting up your grow environment, ultimately, if you want to keep consistent production, is one of the most important things, not only to learn the actual needs that the mushrooms have, but how to like maintain and keep it clean so you don't grow bacteria and mold everywhere. So that's an invite to come out. Oh, please, yeah, absolutely. We got the cards right here. I was told somebody mentioned earlier you have, actually have classes out there. That yes, yep, this. yep. Um, so our, our basic, uh, cultivation class is $55. It's a three hour class. And what we do is we have you guys do all of this. So you go through and you will work in the glove box and you will inoculate some media and you will inoculate some bulk substrate and take that stuff home. So then you can bring it back to your house, watch it grow, watch it, finish it. I won't have a grow environment for you, but like I said, if you do any of our uh, ones that we sell as, as cultivation kits, you can do it right on your kitchen countertop as far as the actual producing of the mushroom part goes. So we just kind of walk you through the sterile part. We kind of guide your hand, and both of our lab techs who have been in the, the biological industry for a long time are very good at what they do. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. It's it's a, like I said, it's a three hour class. You leave with tons of stuff and you get a lot of knowledge out of it. So just, just the hands on bit of it to put your hands in here and see how strange it is. But in the end to take this stuff home and grow your own mushrooms is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And the price is very reasonable too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of education, everything out of it. Yeah. So, and then we also offer a more intensive lab class. So that is where we just have groups of two to three people working with our lab technician in our actual lab facility to do a more intensive Petri, to learn how to pour your own Petri dishes and do a lot of the more sterile stuff. That is $120. But after that, you can pretty much start your own farm. So, yep. Yeah. 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 Like I said, just, just coming out there and wrapping your head and visually seeing, you know, it's one thing to say, I, we grow 400 pounds of mushrooms. Well, so what, what does that mean? What does that look like? But to come out there and see the environment and see the pace of things, like if you truly do want to start growing enough mushrooms at home to go to a farmer's market on a weekend and sell shiitakes or something along those lines, you know, it's, it's a good idea to step into and see 
the constant production that is mushroom farming that is so different from any other agricultural process. There's no days off, <laughs> you know, with what we do. Somebody has to be there every day. Yeah. We, you know, it's in a warehouse. It's, it's constant. So. You guys all good? Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm getting hungry. So <laughs> thanks everybody for listening to me talk Thank about you. mushrooms. Uh, like I said, I've got some business cards up here. Feel free, take one, come out to the farm. They've got all the media here. We've got all the media out there. So happy growing.